If some components of the whole ILS system are not functioning, it is recommended that they should be switched off. Two separate transmitters generate the localizer and glide slope signals. Each transmitter receives signals from a pair of amplifiers. Historically, we've been led to understand that both the electronic localizer and glide slope signals form narrow, tightly focused beams which the aircraft receiver sensed. The actual signal pattern is, as you will see, rather different. The two glide slope amplifiers provide signals to the glide slope transmitter. The transmitter then routes the signals to two independent aerials. The two aerials that create the total glide path signal are located on a tower near the runway and a beam the touchdown point. The lower aerial radiates the carrier wave. This carrier is formed by a UHF signal and is modulated or adjusted with two other frequencies of 90 Hz and 150 Hz. The resulting signal contains equal amplitude 90 and 150 Hz modulations. This carrier wave on its own does not provide any glide path guidance. The upper aerial radiates 90 Hz and 150 Hz modulations only. These signals are transmitted in a specific phase relationship with the 90 Hz and 150 Hz signals being transmitted by the lower aerial. As a result, a complex interference pattern is formed, effectively creating upper and lower side lobes as shown in the diagram. The null between the 90 and 150 Hz side lobes define the glide slope. These patterns are designed so that if the aircraft is below the desired 3 degree glide path, it will sense a predominance of 150 Hz. If it is on the desired glide slope, it will sense the null between the 90 and 150 Hz signals so that the flight instruments will show on slope. If it is above the desired 3 degree glide path, it will sense a predominance of 90 Hz. This is the normal operation of the glide slope transmitter. Let's look at the abnormal ILS glide slope transmission that occurred on the night. The glide slope side lobe amplifier was not operating, so the aircraft only received the glide slope carrier wave. Because the carrier signal has equal amplitude 90 and 150 Hz modulations, this signal was electronically interpreted as being on glide slope. But the ILS system is supposed to protect against this type of malfunction. So what are the measures that should prevent a faulty glide slope transmission? The glide slope system has a normal or primary transmitter and a backup transmitter. A sensor on the radiation field monitors the signal integrity. And there is also a status indicator and alarm in the tower. For a Category 1 ILS, ICAO rules specify that an out of tolerance transmission shall not exceed 6 seconds under any circumstance. If the primary transmitter develops a fault, the system should automatically transfer to the backup transmitter. If the changeover does not occur, or the backup transmitter is also faulty, the system is automatically shut down and the alarm in the tower is sounded. However, the runway at Arpia was being extended and the cable was cut between most of the navigation aids and the status display in the tower. This resulted in the NOTAM stating that various navigation aids, including the ILS, were unmonitored. But unfortunately there's more. For maintenance purposes, parts of the ILS system can be shut down in a bypass mode to facilitate calibration. On that night in July 2000, the glide slope transmitter with the inoperative side lobe amplifier was left switched to the maintenance mode via a bypass switch so that the system could not transfer automatically to the standby transmitter. As a result, NZ60 only ever received the carrier wave transmission for the glide slope, and so the aircraft always sensed that it was on slope. As the carrier signal was being received, the aircraft instrument glide slope warning flags consequently were removed from view. Now let's consider what threats exist and what our strategy should be to deal with these threats. 
There are many possible ILS problems, but we can categorise them into four groups. The false glide slope, the false localizer, the erroneous glide slope, and the erroneous localizer. The false glide slope and the false localizer are byproducts of the normal ILS transmission. For example, the glide slope signal is transmitted with additional lobes above the primary 3 degree lobe. The first one has a 9 degree glide path. If this false glide slope was captured, you would have no flags, show on slope, and have a normal ident, but you would need an extreme rate of descent. The best strategy to detect a false glide slope capture is to intercept the glide slope at the initial approach fix to enable a cross check of altitude against position. A false localizer is caused by a similar phenomena to the false glide slope, but in a lateral path. Remember, these false paths exist as a normal byproduct of correct and valid ILS transmissions. The erroneous glide slope will show that you are on slope regardless of your approach slope or where you intercepted it. You will have no flags, have an on slope indication and a normal ident. In addition, your sync rate could look quite reasonable. Even a GPWS would not prevent an accident in this case. The alerts are inhibited if the rate of closure with the ground is within design parameters and especially if the aircraft is configured for landing. Even though the touchdown point might be several kilometres from the runway. However, aircraft fitted with a terrain awareness warning system, for example EGPWS, would receive an alert in this situation. There is one more complication. Many modern aircraft use flight management computers for lateral and vertical guidance. Once they have been programmed to intercept an ILS, they will fly to their estimated intercept point and execute a pre-programmed pitch down manoeuvre in the order of 0 0.05 of a G. This will establish a rate of descent that has no bearing on the actual glide path. Once this pitch down has been completed, the aircraft's flight control computers will react to any sensed glide slope deviation. If the glide slope signal is erroneous and indicates on slope, no corrections will be applied to the descent angle. Add this situation to the mindset of pilots that are correctly indicating ILS is valid and accurate when combined with a distance altitude check at the glide slope capture and you have a recipe for disaster. The single distance altitude check does not guarantee the subsequent descent path. Similarly, a single altitude check crossing the outer marker does not guarantee the glide slope is correct. The best strategy to employ is to periodically cross-check the aircraft altitude against distance during the descent. The localizer signal is formed electronically in the similar way to the glide slope signal. The erroneous localizer presents the same problem but in the lateral path as the erroneous glide slope. Again, you would have an on-center indication, no flags and a normal ident, but the aircraft would not be following the correct path because it would not be getting any lateral deviation information. The best strategy for this fault is to cross-check the ADF or VOR pointers. They will show any tracking discrepancy if they are selected to the outer marker or a nav aid selected at the field. The investigation also looked at human factors issues and specifically the crucial strategies which enabled the NZ-60 crew to prevent this incident from becoming an accident.